All right, so hello everyone. Uh, I'm Alexa. I work at SUSE on container runtime-based stuff, uh, but I also work with OCI, which is the OCI image spec. It's been mentioned a couple of times yesterday. Um, yeah, so today I'll be talking to you all about why uh, container images in their current form, uh, to borrow a phrase, considered harmful, and some things we can do, with, we can do about it. So um, first of all, where can you get the stuff I'm talking about? So um, Umochi, which is a tool I wrote that does OCI image building, it was mentioned yesterday, uh, you can get it from here, and I'm gonna give a demo later, which hopefully will work. Um, and there's a branch there with all the code, so you can play around with it yourself and tell me when it breaks. Um, I have a blog post that I pu published earlier this year about uh, problems with tar specifically in relation to container images. I'm going to go through uh, a fair bit of it today, um, but it's like 20 pages long and I can't really express that in 30 minutes. So um, if you would like to go and read me going slowly insane, you can go look it up there. Um, and yeah, you can get my talks later from my GitHub. So. The first point, I guess, is like a theoretical question about what is the best possible image format we can imagine? What, what are the features we want? What are the things we want it to have? Um, and this is just a list that I've come up with, which I think sort of summarizes what most people want. Um, the first one is deduplication. This is sort of the big thing you don't want to have to constantly, and this is of both transfer and storage, so you don't want to have to be downloading stuff you already have on your machine or on your server, and you also don't want to be uh, wasting disk space, having copies of files that you already have a representation of on your disk. Uh, you want it to be parallelizable. Um, hello? Okay. Uh, you want it to be parallelizable, so you want it to be the ability of actually to, to both download many different things at the same time, as well as um, extract them or otherwise represent them on the file system uh, in parallel. You want it to be reproducible, uh, because if you have two different tools that build the same image or build an image that is very similar, you want it to be that this deduplication, whoops, uh, that this deduplication will uh, deduplicate between them, even though they've never seen each other. Uh, Non-avalanching, uh, effectively this is, I'm borrowing a term from cryptography here with avalanching um, like hash functions. Effectively you want it to be the, sorry, scraping up against my beard. Um, uh, yeah, you want it to be non-avalanching. So in other words, if you make a small change in a, in a single file inside a container image, you don't want to have to, have to make an entire copy of the, of the whole thing all over again. Um, and transparency, which is related to um, you know, what is actually inside a container image. Um, so, let's just, this is what a container image looks like, um, an OCI container image. The same applies to Docker, uh, to Docker images, the, the formats are basically identical, minus a few changes. Um, and the main thing we're going to be talking about today is, is this part here, these layers. So I mean, I'm sure you're all aware of the fact that container images have layers in them. This is sort of the first thing you see when you first run Docker build or Docker run, where you download all these different things. And all of, every single one of these layers is, is a separate tar archive of a root file system that is then applied in order. So um, what's wrong with tar? Uh, there are a couple of things wrong with it. Um, so if we go back to this ideal image format, so this is everything you want. Uh, this is what tar gives us. Um, so uh, basically none of it. None of these features that we would like are actually present in tar archives, especially with the way that we use them. Uh, and this is the part where I'm going to tell you all about all the various problems you can run into with tar archives. So the first one is, let's imagine you have a container where you have a large file, 10 gig file, you touch the file, so you update its metadata, uh, but you haven't touched the data of the file. You would assume that, well, okay, this layer has to have this metadata in it, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't copy the entire file into both layers. Well, you do, actually, you because tar does not support the concept of a metadata entry. It only supports full files. You have to make an entire copy of the 10 gig data. So now you've doubled the size of your image or doubled the size of this file in, in the second layer, even though you haven't changed it. And the other thing is that when you extract these layers, uh, there's no way of, well, Currently, we don't, have, we don't have this optimization, and it would be quite difficult to do, but effectively, you extract the 10 gig archive, and then you re-extract it a second time. Um, completely pointlessly, right? You, you already have the whole thing. Why would you need to re-extract it twice? Uh, but okay, this is something which, and this is an argument you can cut into, is like, if you look into all of the various tar extensions, there is an extension which you, in theory, could use to solve this problem, uh, but then you run into this, uh, sorry, and the other, th there's a second problem, which is, um, uh, if you delete a file, uh, 
If you delete a file, you don't modify the original layer because this would be bad. So instead, what you do is you put like a tombstone in the new in the new layer, which means that if you delete a file in a container image, not only does the container image not get smaller, it actually gets bigger. It gets slightly bigger by whatever the size of an of a tar archives um, header header section is. Um, which and I'm not I'm not pranking you. That's like that's actually how it works. Oh, as an aside, this means that you can't create a file called .wh anything inside an OCI image or inside a Docker image. In fact, go you try this after the talk. Run Docker, touch .wh.foo, then commit the image, and then run it again. You'll see that your file has disappeared. Um, it's because this, this is not supported. Um, yeah, which is, which is very fun. Um, so OK, the other problem is that let's imagine you modify the file slightly. It's a 10 gig file. You flip a bit. You add a little bit of data to it. Now you have to now even with the metadata extensions that some that some tar formats support, um, there's no way to solve this problem within tar because well you have to have the entire thing because there is no way to to express. Listen, I already have this file, but add this little bit to it. Here's the diff from the previous version. Um, another problem is let's imagine that we have two versions of some image. You've downloaded this one already, and then you download this other one. You have to re-download the entire thing, because the whole thing is one tar blob. There's not really much you can do about it. You have to get a whole copy of the entire thing, even though only a couple of, uh, of binaries have been added. You still have to download the entire thing. Oh, and also, if you, if you extract these, uh, these are two different uh, archives. They get extracted separately. So there's no deduplication on the storage side. So this is, this is, this is duplication on the transfer side, which is that you're, you're downloading stuff you already have. But then when you finally extract it, you don't even get deduplication on the storage side on, on the file level. So if you have two copies of Bash, I mean, how often does Bash get updated in, in Ubuntu, right? Or how often does Ping get updated in Ubuntu? Not very often. So it's, um, it's a bit silly to have to not just re-download Ping every every time you download a new Ubuntu update. Yep. OK. Uh, yep, sorry. Uh, every time you download a new Ubuntu update, um, you have to re-download it. And once you do the extraction on the storage side, you've now stored twice as much needlessly. Um, and another thing is, is that uh, different distributions ship similar things. Um, this is a little bit, I'm being a little bit optimistic here. Um, in reality, binary, when you compile different binaries and different distributions, they actually come out differently. Um, but there are, there are files shared between distributions, and it makes a little sense to re-download them each time you, you, um, you, you get a different image. Um, Oh, and, and <laughs> so this is the, and then also tar is not reproducible. So if you have, uh, aside from the fact there is actually no, no real spec for tar, at least there's no spec for the tar that everyone uses in modern use, um, if you get past that, even if you use the same version, uh, there are all sorts of ways that you can get mess, uh, mess around with. For instance, you can end up with the wrong order of entries inside a tar archive. And even if you work around this, uh, for instance, the Go, um, the Go archive tar implementation, extended attributes are a map. And in Go, maps are not deterministically ordered when you iterate through them. So when it actually gets splatted out as a tar archive, uh, it's, it's not in order. So effectively, if you redo this a couple of times, you'll end up in different archives, even though nothing has changed about it. And even if you were to iterate through the file system in order and all the rest of it. Um, so what's the alternative? So these are, sort of, these are the problems with tar archives. Uh, there are many, many more. If you, if you would like to ask me later, I would I'd be very, very happy to tell you over several beers, um, because I need to like, express the anguish. But if we get past all of that, what is, what is our alternative? So um, we take this existing structure where we have you know, uh, the index, which has, oh, sorry, I forgot to explain this. Uh, index effectively is like, uh, is a, um, an index effectively has, it's, it's when, you open, when you have like Ubuntu 1804, this is what stores the tag. So it has a link from a tag to a manifest. The manifest stores your configuration, oh, points to your configuration. Configuration includes stuff like, I don't know, the working directory, what user you're running as, these sorts of things. And then it has this set of layers. Um, these are all content addressable, so they're all by hashes, which would make you think that you get the duplication. And you do get the duplication for each, for each blob, but you don't get it anywhere else. So the idea is, is to go from this to this. So we still keep the index, we still keep the config, but rather than having these layers, we instead expose uh, all of the inode structures, so in other words, all of the files and directories to OCI, and then we have uh, each file gets effectively chunked up, and I can go into what type of chunking 
the whole chunking topic, but effectively you end up with a blob for each file, or if the file's really big, you end up with a bunch of different blobs such that if you change, back to the 10 gig use case, if you change one byte inside a 10 gig file, you don't have another 10 gig blob needlessly inside your image store. Um, and uh, yeah, and so this is, and then this is not avalanching, so if you change a single chunk, then yeah, you have to regenerate this, this root blob, which is a JSON, well, currently a JSON, we can have that discussion later. Uh, it's, it's a JSON which has pointers to all this stuff. Um, yeah, the chunk gets updated, yeah, the root gets updated, you have to update these things, but you don't have to, you don't have, to have an entire copy of, of ZSH, of ping, and everything else inside your image. Um, and this also helps on the download side as well. Uh, so inside this inode structure, we have the type, the metadata, and then uh, we have like inline data. So uh, for inline data, what we would do is, this is for thing like symlinks. It wouldn't make sense to have an entirely new blob inside the content addressable store just to store the contents of a symlink. So we sort of inline this. This is just like a, a map of, of strings to strings. Uh, the same thing applies to like device, uh, devices, like character devices. You would store the major and minor number and all the rest of it. Uh, and then indirect data, data is only used for files, and this is where you point to chunks inside the store. Okay. Um, and this is actually, and so then we can start playing around with some interesting optimizations. So rather than having to do the current method, which is that when you have a OCI v1 image or a Docker image, you have all these different layers. The only way that you can extract these to create a root file system is you extract each tar archive one by one, and then you uh, create your root file system. This means that if you have, as I mentioned earlier, if you have two layers that have uh, the same file, it's the same hash, um, you have to make two copies of it. So on the storage side, you've doubled the, the storage size. What we can do by having this, this opaque structure, oh no, sorry, transparent structure, is that you can have an intermediate inode cache where effectively you have your, your root with all your inodes in it, you have all these blobs. You then reconstruct, you, because you have this inode in the, uh, in the inline data for files, we store the digest of the entire file. So you can, uh, when you're extracting a file, you can first check do I already have the data on disk in this inode cache? And then you can ref link it into the root file system, which then gives you, it gives you several things. The first thing it gives is it gives you file-based ba uh, file deduplication on the storage end of things, which currently does not exist within, within Docker at all. You can't do this unless you were to create a, a layer for each file, which, well, some people might think of doing this, but uh, as far as I'm aware, no one really does this. Um, but also, but, but you get it for everything. And also, because ref links don't require privileges, this also lets you have, uh, as rootless containers or unprivileged, uh, unprivileged users, can extract these file systems, and they get deduplication even though they, they can't mount overlayFS, because the, the traditional way of doing deduplication is with overlayFS. Obviously, unprivileged users, unless you're in Ubuntu, can't mount overlayFS. Um, so this, this gets past that problem. Uh, and it also gives you uh, file-based dedupe, which is pretty neat. Um, so yeah, so it's time for me to give you a demo. Um, yeah, so uh, I, w I did write this code just as an assistant in advance in case it doesn't work. I did write this code last night, so if, if it, uh, let's, let's hope this works. Can everyone see that? Nothing. No? Can I, <laughs> oh my god. Uh, okay, let's, okay. You, you're, you're all free for the next five minutes. Um, background. Sorry? Is this not? Yeah, hang on. Uh, foreground. Uh... OK, well, you can't read my. OK, well. <laughs> um... Hmm. OK. Let's just, OK, this should be fine. Um... Okay, I'll, fine, I'll switch to bash. All right, um, okay, all right, whatever. Let's, let's switch to bash, oops. It's going well, all right. Um, so everyone can read that, I hope. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, so here we have an OCI v1 image. Um, uh, uh, lists. Oh my God. Uh, yeah, so we have an OCI v1 image that has a couple of Ubuntu images inside it. So this is, and this, uh, this is actually two versions of 1904 with just a, a single package update effectively uh, that I downloaded on like two different days. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to 
show you what it looks like when you do this snapshotting. So if I do emoji unpack, uh, uh, never, never mind, don't worry about it. Um, it's a uh, it's, it's, it's short, it doesn't matter. Okay, so sudo emoji, emoji unpack image of CIV1. Um, uh, 1904, new. Yeah, so I'm extracting, what I'm doing here is, uh, is so Mochi is a tool that lets you extract uh, images. It lets you do um, image manipulation. It's, you can use it to build build tools. Um, what this is doing is that it's taking, from this OCI image store, it's extracting the image that's called um, 1904 new, and then it's putting it inside a uh, an OCI runtime bundle uh, with that name. So this contains the configuration which you would use with run C, and then it has a root file system which is what I've extracted. Um, as an aside, Ubuntu doesn't set the uh, the uh, make time of, of slash, so it, it's uh, we're, we're in the 70s now, and uh, yeah, it has some other stuff that, that's not really interesting for this. So yeah, so we have these two images. And now we're going to snapshot them. So if I do Mochi, uh, so I'm going to create a new, um, a new like OCI store. So this is a separate content addressable store. And then I am going to uh, Mochi two snapshot image OCI v two one two nineteen oh four four new. And then I'm going to snapshot uh, the root of s. Okay, and so what this has done is that it's constructed, if we go back to here, it's constructed, it's constructed this entire root tree. So it's, what, I, what this just did is it constructed the entire root tree, it constructed all these chunks, put them all in the image store and, and all the rest of it. And if you look, uh, whoops, if you look inside uh, um, OCIv2, blob, 56, there's like, 2,000 blobs in here now because obviously each file has been expanded and, and all the rest of it. Um, so now if we then, we can now do the same thing for, uh, whoops, we can do the same thing for uh, the old one as well. And because they share, um, because they share OCI v2, because they share a lot of blobs, actually. So it should be noted, these are uncompressed. I'm not compressing any of these blobs. I didn't have time to implement the compression for it. But these are uncompressed files, and it, has, it takes up 86 megs. A single Ubuntu image, when you extract the tar archive, is about, 70, is about 70 megs. So there's only been a 10 meg change in this entire image. With OCI v1, if OCI wasn't, if it wasn't compressed, if you don't take into account compression, uh, it would have doubled the size because you'd have to have a copy of the entire thing twice. So, um, yeah, so now I can now uh, restore these images so I can unpack them. Uh, oh, actually, I should probably show you, so just to show you what it looks like. So if I now go and look at, um, uh, um, hang on, sudo jq dot, to blobs, shot 56, and then I'll we'll take a look at take a look at this thing. Oh, sorry, I should put that to less. Okay, so um, so this is this is basically the root the root that we have here, right? So that's this thing, the root. You can now see it here, and it's a directory, the metadata, inode, mode, all the rest of it, um, and then. For symlinks, uh, so this is a symlink, obviously. The target is inlined, and if we go look at a file, uh, the file has, it has the digest of the entire file stored inside it, which allows us to do this caching with file stores. And it has, um, this file is empty. Let me look at a file that isn't empty. Um, uh, Perl, Perl isn't empty. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so we, we have this, and then inside we, this is chunked. So th these are two separate chunks that you can concatenate to get the, to get the, uh, the final um, image, and you have, um, yeah, and then, you ha and then you have all the rest of it. So now what I can do is I can now restore this. So much E2, restore, uh, image, OCI V2, 
1904, new. Uh, and what restore does, and this is kind of neat, I'm, I'm surprised it worked. Well, I shouldn't say that out loud. Um, I'll say that after it works. Uh, so yeah, I've supported this, this ref linking of file stores. So what you can now do is you can now have rootfs1. Shoot on it as root. OK. OK, so this is going to take a second because it has to reconstruct everything. It has to get all these blobs. It has to rebuild everything. But the file store is now populated with all of the blobs from this image. So if I now create a second rootfs, it's, almost, it's done almost instantly. And the and there is, so first of all, it's quicker because uh, you don't have to open these files, read all of them, and all the rest of it because you can just look at the digest and say, oh, wait, I already have this inode over here. I'm just going to ref link this one without having to, to copy everything. So it's nice because it's faster. I don't know about you, but I find pulling images to be like the slowest thing in the world, especially in Australia, because you have to also download the thing, and like 100 meg images takes forever. Um, but secondly, it's, it, it gives you the duplication on the storage side of things. Um, so if I did this a bunch of times, the storage overhead would effectively just be the overhead of the inodes, because all the data is being deduplicated. And then if I was to extract the old one, which only has like 100 meg diff, um, it also finishes pretty quickly because it because the inodes are the same. Like half of well, more than half, you know, 90% of the stuff isn't different between two different versions of Ubuntu. So even though it had new inodes, it reconstructed the file. The file store dealt with it all, and inside the file store is yet another. Uh, oh my God, uh, is another content addressable store. So it's you know. It's just a bunch of content addressable bits, and then and then these bits are being ref linked in. And yeah, all good. So this, this already gives you a lot of benefits. Obviously, once this is uh, both polished and used elsewhere, um, this gives you a lot of benefits over, uh, over the existing tar-based solutions. Um, but the, ne the next question is, is, what is, uh, what is the next thing we can do? What is the next, uh, whoops. Yep, OK, what is the next step we can do? So one of the things that is sort of an ex a very, very long-standing problem with container images is that uh, you don't know what's inside it. Um, with, with layers, you have these tar archives. And yes, you could open the tar archive, and you can parse through it, and you can read out the contents, and you can hash them, and all the rest of it. And then you, you could, in principle, compare with something else. Um, so image scanners do this. It's quite intensive, because you have to, you have to read through tar archives every single time. And there's, there's also no ecosystem around distributions giving you, like, this file has this hash, effectively. So. Um, how do, we get how do we get around this? Because this store is entirely, is entirely transparent to OCI, and because the digest of each file is stored inside it in principle, and this is sort of where we get into hand-wavy territory because uh, we, uh, this is all stuff that's still in my head, but I'm hoping will work out, um, is we can actually start looking at having effectively distributions or vendors shipping, uh, preferably signed, obviously, uh, manifests saying that libfubar version x is, contains these files with these digests. Um, there is a slight complication with, with config files. There are ways we can try to work around it. But at least, for, at least for binaries, it's the case that you could do this very trivially, as well as you know, base config files, where you say, OK, from vendor x, libfubar blah has these files in it. And then you can very, very cheaply just iterate over th this list of inodes is just a list in, well, currently JSON, but it can be whatever serialization you like. Um, this, you can just iterate through the list, check, does, it ha does this exist? Does it have the right mode? Does the have the right digest? And you never have to touch any of these chunks, um, which means that scanners will, will, will improve from this. And also, we, it's actually now possible for us to think about having an ecosystem about distributions and other vendors shipping these types of manifests and linking it up. Um, and so on, which I think, which I think is going to be, would be quite exciting to see um, as as future work. And obviously, uh, we'll, we'll take a, we'll take even more work, but we'll see. Um, so yeah. So what are the next steps? Um, so the next steps are that one of the things, and this is this is where I slightly cheated. So one of the problems. So the first thing is we need to reduce the size of transfers. So if you look at the OCI v2, uh, uh, the OCI v2 image. It's only 86 megs, even though it has two images in it. Um, and if you compare this to the OCV1 one, it's, it's bigger, but the OC, OCIV1 one is compressed, remember. So if we were to do compression on this, um, it would be better. Um, but the main problem actually is that, um, as, as I mentioned before, um, the deduplication you get from chunk-based dedupe um, on a file level, uh, you would 
especially when you're downloading images from different vendors and different distributions, it's actually quite surprising how little similarities there are between distributions in a lot of cases. This is something I ran into last week, and I was like desperately trying to come up with a solution for it. Uh, obviously, I'm putting it in next steps because I didn't come up with a solution for it. Um, but one of the possible solutions, and this is actually, I hope to speak to, to Lenard about this uh, afterwards, is we could, we could think about um, decoupling the way that the storage works, because this, this store where you have uh, a single file that has all the data in it, and it has this digest information, is very, very useful to make the optimizations I mentioned. But it's not, um, but for transfers, it's not ideal. Aside from the fact that obviously when you're transferring images, if you have, again, one Ubuntu image has like 2,000 blobs in it, um, currently image registries are already struggling with one blob for the entire thing. Um, you would have having 2,000 round trips each time you want to download an image is a little bit extreme. Um, so we would need to think about whether we can come up with a different, different protocol for doing the transfers. Um, the other thing is, is uh, yeah, the bill of material stuff is, is very much hand wavy. I have no idea how this would actually work in real life and, and what type of concessions we would have to make. Um, so we need to sit down and, and design it. Um, hopefully folks will come up with ideas um, afterwards that they can tell me about. Um, and uh, this is all, obviously, this is all an experimental branch of Imachi. Uh, there is absolutely no spec document whatsoever. I, I raged through this uh, like at 10 p.m. yesterday, so um, I can't really show you exactly what the spec should look like, especially because there are probably more things that people want or want to put in, and how, we, how do we handle this? And currently, it's all in JSON, and uh, JSON has, uh, it has problems, um, but these, these things we, we can discuss. And finally, get everyone to switch. And this is, this is sort of the, the biggest problem, to be honest. All this other stuff is just sort of work that someone could do and, and it could get done. But switching is sort of the really painful part because obviously right now people are still using, uh, they're not even using OCI images in most cases, they're still using Docker images with, even though they're very similar, they're not exactly the same. And these improvements, while they, at least in my opinion, I think they would help a lot of people uh, improve their efficiency of, of container runtimes when they deal with images, you have to get people to switch to OCI v2. And I mean, if, if it's difficult to get people to switch to OCI v1, which has basically the same structure it, almost down to, down to the, ver the last detail, um, I can only imagine how complica complicated it's going to be to get OCI v2 going. Um, but yeah, I think, I've, I, think I finished a bit early. Um, so I, I have any questions. I can go through the chunking stuff if anyone's interested uh, about that. But yes, OK, I'll go through the chunking stuff then. All right. so. Um, We'll do questions in a second. So the, the problem with, the problem with storing, storing whole files, and this, this is actually interesting, is, is the different choices you can make to solve this problem. So um, as, as you might have seen, uh, uh, as you might have seen when you were looking at, let's go look at Perl again, um, you'll notice that uh, these two chunks are not the same size. As also, the, they're basically a random size if you look at the other one. Um, yeah, these are these. Well, they're both Perl. Doesn't matter. The point is, is that these are these are different. Uh, these are different sizes, um, and the reason why you you don't want to do fixed size chunking is is this for this. So, um, if you imagine a file, and if you were to do fixed size chunking, you so you split it up at four K sizes. This actually gives you, as an aside, the ref linking stuff I was doing. Um, if we could do this easily, then you would get even better uh, deduplication because uh, you could deduplicate not just on the file level, but you could deduplicate on like the 4K sector size level because uh, on Linux there is a limitation with uh, the, the underlying uh, the underlying system that the ref links uses, which is that uh, you can't because file systems are extent based, um, you can't like deduplicate half of an extent. It has to be extent sized effectively. This is this limitation extents of 4K on Linux. Um, and I, I looked into it. You can't make them one byte. Uh, this was an idea. It would be awful to do, but it's actually not possible. Um, in case any of you are wondering whether this is possible. Um, but yeah, so if you were to cut it up in 4K sector sizes, this would help us with the deduplication. But you run into this problem. So OK, let's, we have foo inside this large file. And if we swap the foo to a bar, all good, right? Great, we have it in the same sector. No, no big problem. The problem comes when you have an insertion or a deletion. So if you insert baz in the middle of this file, uh, not only does that sector get invalidated, but the rest of it gets invalidated as well. So effectively, you, you run into an immediate problem where uh, any insertions, and obviously 
Uh, most times you edit a config file or modify a config file, these are insertions, not, re not replacements. Um, so you would run into this problem very, very quickly when it comes to, yay, we're deduplicated, but we've only deduplicated the first third of the file in most cases. Um, so this doesn't work. So um, yeah, so the solution is actually is a very, very old solution to this problem, which is content-defined chunking. So rather than chunking by fixed sizes, we chunk based on uh, the contents themselves. So uh, there, is, there is a paper by, uh, by Michael Rabin um, using Rabin fingerprints. Guess what the name came from? Um, to, to basically, you can fingerprint the data, you can, and then you can do content-defined chunking. And so the way this works is it's basically like it's a mix of rolling hashing and like Bitcoin or number wang, uh, whichever one you prefer. Um, effectively, you, have, uh, you, you take the entire file, and then you chunk it up this way. And the way you determine where the chunk boundaries are is that effectively you check whether or not the last 64 bytes or whatever the window size is, whether or not uh, the hash of this using, you, using Rabin fingerprinting, whether the fingerprint is less than a certain number. So whether it has a certain bits zeroed, which is basically how Bitcoin works. Um, well, well, let's not get into that. The point is, this is a very similar idea. Like you effectively decide the chunks this way. And then as, if you have, uh, as long as those last 64 bytes don't get affected, um, then insertions and delete, so obviously changes is uh, as normal, but insertions, uh, the, the boundary moves along with the insertion. Uh, and if, if the last bit were to get modified, then you would invalidate two, chunk, two chunks, but that wouldn't be too bad. I mean, even in the worst case, you're not, you're not invalidating the entire file. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's basically how chunking works. When you hit the boundary. Sorry? Yeah, or, or if it's modified. So if the boundary is modified, then it won't hash the same thing, but the next boundary will still hash the same thing. So you've invalidated this one and the next one, but the rest are, unless obviously the insertion has added a boundary extra, there are like lots of cases where this can, where this can break. But um, in most cases, it's probably quite statistical, but in most cases it does work out. Um, and this, this idea I stole, um, Actually, the entire idea for this, for this design I stole from a backup tool called Restic that I use. They have a, basically the exact same design for, for, for all of this. Um, I think they don't, they don't have a linear list. They have it as like a tree of blobs. Um, this is actually my, I was my first attempt at this, and the last time I gave this talk, my idea was to do it using a tree of blobs, where you have like, oh, a directory has children that you point to. Um, turns out if you run this on like Fedora, if you do this snapshotting on Fedora, uh, there are more metadata blobs, in other words, more blobs that describe directory and directories don't have any contents other than their children, which you can figure out from their path name. Um, there are more of those blobs than there are of actual data, um, which obviously is given the other problems with, with lots of blobs is, is a bit wasteful. So, um, but it's basically the same idea. Um, anyway, so uh, that's basically it for this. Uh, any questions? Uh, you, you, uh, your reflink trick won't necessarily work if things are compressed on disk. Can you talk a little bit about what your vision is for compression in, on the storage format once you've downloaded the image? Yeah, so, um, so there is, yes, so there are actually, um, there are several ways of handling this. Um, one of them, so right now, because we do the chunking inside the OCI spec, uh, you have to have the second inode cache. Uh, and for, compression, for, for transfers, if we were to use OCI regular transfer, we would have to do compression on the blobs because otherwise you just end up, with, like, we lose immediately to just tar archives, which is not a good place to be. Um, it doesn't feel very nice when you're losing to, 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 to a format that has so many problems. Um, but the solution to this actually might be um, if we were to actually abandon the idea of having the blobs we have in OCI be used as a transfer medium. So in other words, um, you, you actually would store the entire thing. So in other words, you could merge the inode cache with, with this, where rather than pointing to a bunch of chunks, you just point to one blob. And then on the transfer side, we use something like CA sync and or these other things, which on the transfer side can, can help us with um, with do, doing all the chunking, because really, because we can't chunk on the file system because we don't because we don't have fixed size extent, uh, fixed size chunks, um, we can get we don't need really in inside this image store to do it. Especially because, and this is also a little secret, is that um, the inode cache has to be a full copy. So uh, this actually doubles the storage size because you have one copy for OCI and then one copy for the image for the inode cache. The nice thing with this model is you can reuse the image store for different storage drivers. Um, but if you merge the inode cache, then you would have to have a copy of the image in each storage driver. 
But yeah, the, uh, my, my idea actually is that the best way to do this might be to merge the two and then ref link directly from the OCI store into the root file system. And then on the transfer side, we do, we do chunking. Does that make sense? Well, OK. You're not happy, but um, I'm sure you'll let me know about that later. Could you talk about rendering the file system for starting a container? Do you think it's a good idea to use Fuse or something like that? Sorry, can you say that again? Uh, do you think it's a good idea to use a Fuse? OK. Um, just, well, oh, right, as in like use Fuse the root file system and then open the, the uh, OCI blobs like that way without having this, this reflink store. Yeah, this is something that I have considered. Um, the main, well, I've been told that Fuse performance is getting better. This, and and this, is, this is, it would be doable. You could do it. And, and I think that um, it's, if this is something that people are interested in doing, it would be definitely something you could do. But I think that, um, I think, I think you, well, in my opinion, I think you can design something that has, uh, that works for this mo mode that also works fine for the fuse mode. And actually, Tycho, the guy who just asked the question, has this incredibly crazy idea of having, like, you can mount, the, like, have an in-kernel driver that mounts this thing and then does it without fuse at all, which is extra crazy. And, but this would, but the point is, is that the design, at least as far as I can tell, would still work uh, either way, even if you decide to use fuse or use this reflink model. And the nice thing about the, well, these days, you, do have, you can do Fuse unprivileged, but um, if we were speaking a year ago, I could tell you that this, this allows you to do it unprivileged as well. Um, but yeah. Hey, hi. Yes. This looks, like a, this looks a lot like a Git. Have you thought of that? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, uh, it, it does, uh, though um, I don't actually have a counter argument against that. It does look like it, right? Uh, it looks very much like it. Uh, Basically, this is a consequence of, um, of OCI basically taking the same idea that Git has, which is the content addressable store and all the rest of it. Um, I actually looked into Git pack files to see whether or not we could reuse this for distribution. Um, as far as I can tell, I mean, obviously, I've looked at it for like a bit, but as far as I can tell, the, the, the optimization that Git deals with don't really apply to what we need. For instance, uh, Git, you generally, I would hope no one checks in like a copy of Perl into their Git tree. I'm sure someone does, but, uh, but assuming you don't do that, right? Or, or assuming you, well, more importantly, I hope you don't like Git commit an entire like so, uh, distributions, like and all its files. Uh, yeah, okay, well. All right, well, maybe Git, <laughs> okay. Um, you know what I said? Yes, it is like Git, and, uh, and, and I have looked at actually, I have looked at what Git does for, for various things to see whether we can, we can take improvements, um, but yeah. So Hello. did you play with different chunk sizes? Different chunk sizes. Uh, yes, I tried to, well, I did try to vary different chunk sizes, so um, yeah, and I actually tried different chunking algorithms. So for instance, the async uses, uh, um, buzz hash, which is a different chunking, which is a different uh, fast uh, fingerprinting or hashing algorithm that lets you you do a very similar trick. Um, as far as I can tell, uh, you don't get. I have tried for a couple of different chunk sizes, and each time the the like inter distribution du duplication is not very good, as far as I can tell. It might be that um, that if you had I don't know. If it was the case that all the files were compacted together, maybe it would be better, but I don't know. I, this is something I'm not entirely sure about because my first impression was, oh, if I play with the chunk sizes, the chunk size is too big or it's too small. Maybe if I make it smaller, it'll, it'll deduplicate better between distributions. Um, that sort of works, but it doesn't give you the benefits you would think it does effectively. Um, but yeah. Oh, that's it? Okay. You can ask me outside. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I know there was more questions.